The Oregon State Beavers take the first edition of the Pac-2 Championship this weekend at Research Stadium in Corvallis, Oregon. They snap a five-game losing streak. Washington State, in the second week in a row, head into a road matchup, 12-point favorites, and yet again lose. And yet again, it is the Washington State defense to blame. The offense puts up points. The defense cannot stop anyone. To set the stage for this episode, the past three weeks for Oregon State against Cal, San Jose State, and Air Force, they scored a total of 20 points. They were blanked at Air Force last week, 28-0. And yet, in this matchup against Washington State, they were able to put up 41 points, totaling 484 yards, 314 in the air, and 170 on the ground. Oregon State was 7 of 15 on third down and 4 of 5 on fourth down. Oregon State also dominated the time of possession. They held onto the ball for 38 minutes and 23 seconds, whereas the Cougs had it for 21 minutes and 37 seconds. And WSU could not get Oregon State to punt the ball even one time. The Beavers scored on all of their offensive possessions outside of two interceptions in the second half, as well as a failed fourth down conversion. And heading into the half, Oregon State needed just 44 seconds to drive 61 yards down the field for a touchdown to put them up 21 to 17 at half. Over the last two weeks against New Mexico and Oregon State, Washington State University has given up 1,018 yards and a total of 79 points. The defense the past two games has averaged giving up over 500 yards per game. That cannot happen. Two weeks ago, we were talking about how the Cougs just might squeak into the college football playoff. After last night's loss, we're talking about how anyone involved with the defense needs to find the nearest exit. So without further ado, let's get into this week's episode with Dylan Howe, recapping this game as well as where the Cougs are heading moving forward. And this episode is sponsored by Cougfan.com. If you are a fan of WSU athletics, whether it be football, basketball, any sport, Cougs, make sure to check out Cougfan.com. They have the latest and greatest news, recaps, and previews for every game upcoming. Dylan and I are teaming up with Cougfan.com to bring you some of the latest and greatest with all things WSU athletics. We're also hoping to get some players on for interviews soon, so stay tuned. And as always, if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, I myself am a mortgage broker full time. Make sure to reach out. I'll have my contact information in the description of this video if you'd like to reach out and connect. And with that, let's get into the podcast. The Oregon State Beavers take the first edition of the Pac-2 Championship this weekend at Research Stadium in Corvallis, Oregon. They did whatever they wanted to against the Washington State Cougars. The past three weeks, Oregon State scored a total of 20 points against Cal, San Jose State, and Air Force. They were able to put on 41 points against Washington State's defense. Washington State's defense is now 117th in the nation out of 133 in total yards allowed per game at 437 total yards per game. On the flip side, WCU's offense is 12th in total yards per game with 454.5. WCU's offense has scored 40 touchdowns. WCU's defense has given up 40 touchdowns. You're basically break even. You're hoping to win by a one score margin every game. And that just cannot happen, especially with how good of an offense this WCU team has had. With this win, Oregon State snapped a five game losing streak. And two weeks ago, we were talking about how Washington State just might squeak into the college football playoff. Now we're taking a look at this Washington State defense and anyone associated with the defense is like, find the nearest exit. Yeah, 1000%. You know, it's Buddha Aluta at the end of the game. He, in his press conference, he's saying, hey, you know, like we're there. We're just, we're just not making the play. We're, we're in position to make tackles. We're, we're in position to, to deflect passes. You know, he played a hell of a game. 10 tackles, pick six. You, you thought right there, that was the, the turning point of the game. Even before Buddha Aluka's pick six, you thought Ethan O'Connor's interception was going to be the pendulum for, for the game changing. And, and it just it they just never could break through when the defense finally did get a stop the the offense had a three and out or the offense couldn't muster any points so it's just been kind of brutal luck from that sense also you you hate to to see what happened to a guy like Kyle Williams you know it, it's super unfortunate that that it it happened to be him uh fumbling the ball at the end of the game just from my big J seed I guess for lack of a better term is you got to understand the other side's got one timeout. You've, you've got full control over the clock for the final minute and a half. You got to get down at, at this point. Your offense has gotten anything they've wanted for the most part, all game. Who cares if it's second and one, you know, you got to get down. They had a chance to, you know, worst case run the clock out and go to overtime. You know, again, some, some poor, clock management and and this time you you can kind of put the onus on the players i also didn't agree with 
the timeout uh, strategy again this week from from Coach Dickert. I thought he called his at an inopportune time, but that's what happens. You've got everybody and their brother on social media bashing how they 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 handled the timeout situation in New Mexico, and there was there was nobody in the room that didn't think Coach Dickert made the wrong choice by taking his timeouts back home from New Mexico. So obviously he's probably in his head, maybe at the end of this game, wondering what he's, he's supposed to do. You know, it, maybe they threw their book out the window after the whole analytic comment, but I mean, you know, other aspects, you, you made this offense look fantastic. You had a guy in Trent Walker that you made look like Wes Welker or Cooper Cup out there, 12 receptions. And in many times you're looking at the corners, they're soft coverage. The guy was wide open coming out of his break each time on the field. Then you have a, a guy like Jermaine Terry, who's carrying Cougs in the secondary, carrying Cougs in the end zone. He looked like Antonio Gates out there last night. It just was a total colossal failure again on the defensive side of the ball. You make Bengal Branson look like a, a prominent starting quarterback in college football. I mean, this was a team that didn't even know who was planning on starting at quarterback all week long. Then again, hats off to Oregon State. Well, Branson played great, and they looked at the tape, the New Mexico WSU tape. I mean, they were stupid not to have Gabari Johnson in there. He ran for six times for over 40 yards and a touchdown. Almost fumbled the ball, too, at the end of the game. That that had an opportunity for, for WSU to, to, to regain possession under a minute. And that's just the way, it, you know, the, the football bounces sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't bounce your way. Oregon State really was able to do whatever they wanted to. They had a total time of possession of 38 minutes, 23 seconds. WSU had a time of possession of just 21 minutes, 37 seconds. OSU was 7 of 15 on third down, but then 4 of 5 on fourth down. They had one turnover on downs in the first quarter, but then they were 4 for 4 on fourth downs the rest of the way. And one of those key fourth down conversions was later in the game, fourth and eight. They were able to get that first down, and that conversion also led to a touchdown. Oregon State possessed the ball for a majority of the game, but they also could score as quickly as they wanted to when they needed to. Leading up to halftime, Oregon State took just 44 seconds to drive 61 yards down the field for a touchdown to put them up 21-17 heading into the second half. Also, on their final drive of the game, they drove down the field. It took them a minute and 29 before they kicked that 55-yard field goal, which would end up being the game winner. The past two games, Washington State has given up a total of 1,018 yards and 79 points against New Mexico and Oregon State. And then a tweet from Andrew Quinn, who quoted Eastern Washington University's basketball coach talking about their three-point defense. He said, if our military defended like that, we'd all be speaking Chinese. And how frustrating would it be to go out there and watch your defense give up points and yards like this when you're on the other side of the ball on the offense? If you're John Matier that is constantly shouldering the blame for all these losses, these one score victories that they've had, they're four and two in one score games. They've now lost two very close games the past two weeks. But John Matier week after week is, is shouldering the blame. His quote was, it's upsetting. Nobody likes losing. We're just falling short. They played a good game. Props to them, but it's very upsetting. We came to play overall, but we didn't score enough points, and that's just the way it is. He also said, I could just make easier checks and see the, the defense better and put us in a better situation. I've got to watch the film to really pinpoint what I needed to do better. That's how it always, always is. John Matier, it's not your fault. You're 12th in the country in total yards per game. It's not on you. The defense has to figure this out. I mean, you know, the defense, you saw, you know, oftentimes where the deal was in three in, in a three technique while OSU's in a jumbo set. I mean, it's just like, that's like basic knowledge. You don't do that. Zone schemes where receivers were running free all night long. The man was horrible other than finding a couple interceptions. You go seven, you, you know, allow a team to go seven for 15 on third down and then four for five on fourth down. You, you just simply can't get a stop. When you need it. Now, I, I couldn't tell you how many times on Saturday night I was going to just, okay, it's just one stop. All we need is one stop. I mean, like we said, you know, you thought the pendulum was going to change after the Ethan O'Connor interception. Well, it didn't change there. Then the, then you have the pick six from Buda Alupta. Uh, and, and you're feeling like you're firmly in the driver's seat. And, and you're also feeling like they might, they might cover the spread, which was a joke. And speaking of the spread, WSU has been double digit favorites on the road for the previous two weeks, and they've lost both of those games. Really, 
what you do, you know, kind of pivoting back to material there, I kind of kind of uh, digress. That's the ultimate leader. He's now five straight games without an interception. And I know I was a little vocal early on this year, especially in, in portions of the Fresno State game, the San Jose State game. John has really progressed well this season. And, you know, over the last five weeks, he's been fantastic. He hasn't turned the ball over. He's done everything in his power to give the Cougars a victory. And you know, I've seen a lot of things online where folks are saying, hey, this is the 2019 team with Anthony Gordon reincarnated. Yeah, it's the same same aspect. I do like the analogy, but they're playing Mountain West teams, Connor. They're playing San Jose State. They're playing Fresno State, Utah State. They're not playing Oregon, USC, UCLA, Washington. It's embarrassing. It's absolutely embarrassing what's happened at the end of this year. I just, I, there's not much else you can say. I mean, you, you, we've seen Ben Cole Branson play over the last couple of years. He's not a great quarterback. You know, this is a team that came in with four passing touchdowns. They get half of that this week, throw two passing touchdowns. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's not great. And talking about Mateer, his two rushing touchdowns this game pushed his single season record for rushing touchdowns by a quarterback up to 14. This is also the second most rushing touchdowns by any Cougar player in a single season in history. Jerome Harrison has the record with 16 in 2005. So with two games left, if Mateer were to get three touchdowns over those final two games, he would also be the leading rushing scorer at WSU in a single season, no matter the position. Mateer has a rushing touchdown and a passing touchdown in nine of the Cougars' 11 games this season. He's now responsible for 42 touchdowns this season, which is tying him with Gardner Minshew for the second most in WCU single season history. And as you mentioned, Anthony Gordon, he holds the WCU single season total record with 48 touchdowns back in 2019. And with the results of the past few weeks, we were talking about how Mateer, like I, I thought that he would be staying through next year. You know, the transfer portal opens up in December. There's been rumors that you've been talking about where Oklahoma circles are talking about getting Ben Arbuckle to come over to Oklahoma. Now, what are the odds of Arbuckle and potentially a Mateer going to a, a university like Oklahoma after this year? It's scary. When you take a look, it's kind of the same formula and game plan that Dickert, and previous offensive coordinator, Eric Morris, played with Cam Ward. Obviously, Eric Morris was the head coach at Incarnate Word, and they bring them both over. So that is a very scary proposition you're possibly looking at this offseason. You know, there, there's, there's, there's been some, some, some wind howling with Oklahoma circles and you've seen Ben Arbuckles apparently already interviewed for the job. So obviously that's something to kind of look at going forward. You just hope that, you know, Mateer is like you've said previously, Connor is, is thinking along the lines of uh, Ashton Genty where, Hey, I want to build a legacy here. I, I, I still think we are in the driver's seat, hopefully, to keep him. But the last five weeks of football, you know, he might be turning some heads in SEC and Big 12 circles where it's like, okay, hey, this guy can come in and and throw the rock around, also be just an absolute game changer uh, with his feet. 75 rushing yards against Oregon State. I, I want to say he's probably right around under, under 175 rushing yards. And he's got the Wyoming game and the Bull game. So... You know, it's possible that he could he could break that that thousand mark. I don't know if he's going to be able to do it. You know, it's a it's 250 yards in two games. That's 125 per game on the ground. It's something you'd like to see him break, but it just it just was a tough result. And in that last drive, it it just kills me for Kyle. Um, as you know, as a senior, a guy that's not going to come back, a guy that chose to stay here with us. Obviously, he did get he did get his for staying. Yeah, it's just a that that that. It was a soul crushing loss. And if Washington State had won this game, I was going to bring up a, a point. It's like John Mateer is the leading scorer in the country. He is responsible for the most total points in all of the country. How is he not being talked about in any circles regarding the Heisman? I understand the schedule compared to other, you know, Cam Ward, some of those guys, but Ashton Genty, he, he's having a standout year. He's playing against the same opponents. Heading into next year, John Mateer very well should be one of those frontline guys for the Heisman heading into the next season. 
Yeah. But, you know, when we take a look at heading into next season, okay, we're now we're heading into year six of Dickert's defense. And on last year's team, we had two guys that could get after the quarterback and Ron Stone and Brennan Jackson. We had a guy in the secondary named Jaden Hicks that covered up a lot of flaws. And so did those two pass rushers. There's nothing you see on this defense that you're looking at going in to next year like okay well we're, we're building on that well the linebackers are slow they can't catch up there needs to be a recruiting pivot they need to be going after guys that are undersized at linebacker but can run a four or five or can run a four seven and at least make a play we're slow we're slow on defense you know we get caught looking in the secondary and then the defensive line, there's just not enough pressure. You know, Dinba's done a great job over the last four or five weeks. Edson's not your your rush guy. That's not what his onus is on defense. I thought I, I thought he's been fairly fairly adequate this year on the defensive line. It's 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 very sketchy what you're looking at going into next year, and, and you're saying, wow, this defense isn't great. Well, we're gonna lose Kyle Williams, so you don't really have your go-to threat. Chris Hudson's gonna be gone, so now you have two senior receivers dip in you know there's never really been an issue I, I feel felt like with the transfer portal offensively uh in the transfer portal era I, I'm totally comfortable with us there but now I'm at a little bit of a loss of what Dicker is doing here defensively now people calling for his, his head I think that's going overboard there's certainly you could see the war of two sides Dickert's pissed off nobody's showing up there's not enough NIL this and that then you have the fan side of things. Well, okay, Schmetting's been here for 27, 28 games now. Like the tail of the tapes there. What's going on with this defense? You've got to make a big boy move when you're the head coach. Sometimes those decisions can be hard because, yeah, these guys are all friends. They all care about their families, this and that. It's, it's a tough lifestyle. But you know what? At the end of the day, results speak for themselves. Numbers speak for themselves. And this defense is just not getting the job done. Spending, Schmetting is just not getting the job done here. So I, I hope there's Black Monday tomorrow. I hope we see either a resignation or he's fired. See ya. If I go into work and I'm 117th out of 133, I'm probably not keeping my job. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I am either. And one of the only bright spots for, for the defense next year is true freshman Ethan O'Connor. He's got four interceptions now in the year. He's up to 29 total tackles. But as you mentioned, outside of that, there's not much to look for. Again, Kyle Thornton is another one of those guys who's going to be graduating and leaving the team. So this next week, it will be senior night in Pullman. They will be playing Wyoming, looking to move to 9-3 and three on the year. This would be the 11th time in university history that the Cougs would have nine wins on the season. So make sure to tune into that. And then Dylan, what do we have for basketball this week? The Acrisure Holiday Invitational in Palm Springs begins Tuesday of next week for the Cougs. That's a two-game set. There's four teams. Uh, their first round matchup is against Fresno State, who is the head coach of Fresno State was Lawan Watts's high school coach. And then the hope is you take care of a, a pretty bad Fresno State team. You hope that SMU, former USC head coach Andy Enfield, resigned at USC, ended up taking the job at SMU. You hope you can get them because they're in about the in the top 80 in net right now. So you can you know hopefully have a a quad two, possibly a quad one game. So uh, the Cougs are are five and one heading into that matchup. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM. Go follow us on Instagram and TikTok for more, and we'll see you on the next episode.